Judges chapter 6, please. Judges chapter 6 in the scriptures. Should be notes floating around out there somewhere if you'd like them. Judges 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 to begin, and then we're going to skip over. We're going to cover several or a lot of verses this evening, but not all in the beginning here tonight, lest we read and then reread later. So look at Judges 6, 1. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Have we heard that verse or that phrase before in the book of Judges? Yeah. I'm sure if you were a a scribe in the Old Testament, uh, you got tired of writing that phrase uh, if you were copying the book of Judges. But nonetheless, it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was when every Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. Jump over now to verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizirite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Tonight we're going to talk about Judges 6. We're going to look at this first of three messages on Gideon. We're going to look at his calling or what I call getting ready for God's salvation. So let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for tonight. It's time to look at your word, and we pray that as we look back then to a man and your call upon his life, that you will help us not only to learn about this man, Gideon, um, but Father, may we learn about ourselves tonight as well. And so I pray that you will speak to us from your word. I pray your spirit will have free reign to apply these truths to our lives where we need it most. And your word will accomplish your will, and I pray that you will make us into more of the image of your son. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Well, I don't know if I've made it quite a thousand miles yet, but I think I'm probably close with how much I've walked, marched, and ran in the the army in the last 12 years. My first step, though, was to make a phone call. In fact, it was actually two phone calls about 13 years ago. My first phone call, I've shared the story before, my first phone call was actually to an Air Force recruiter, and the Air Force recruiter that I talked to when I explained my intentions, and he had some questions for me about my education and my ministry experience, uh, the Air Force recruiter's advice to me was, call the Army. I can't use you. As I was talking to uh, Sister Kathy this morning, um, we were talking about the different branches of the military, and, and I reminded her or we, as we were talking, I said, yeah, the Air Force is a small branch, and uh, they want very smart people, and I wasn't smart enough for them. And so, but the Air Force recruiter said, call the Army. Uh, they always need people, and uh, they'll take about anybody. And so uh, anyway, I called my next phone call then, December of 2011, my next phone call was to an army recruiter. And uh, he asked me about my education, he asked me about my ministry experience, and he said, uh, I'll I'll email you an application. And so uh, God used that. But then I remember this long process of working with a recruiter. And it wasn't a regular recruiter. It's not the person that you, if you're 17 or 18, 
and you're getting ready to graduate or you just graduate high school and you go in and they have you take an ASVAB and they talk to you about what jobs you want based on how you score. That's a basic recruiter. Uh, they're the ones that, uh, well, this is being recorded, so I won't say what I'm going to say or would say. Uh, but they handle a certain, the, the majority of the populace, right? I, I was talking to a specialty recruiter. Uh, in the Army, they have specialty recruiters that work with chaplains, lawyers, and doctors, or medical people. So I was talking to a specialty, specialty recruiter, uh, and it still took a long time. From that first phone call in December, it ended up taking until September of the following year, until September, and it wasn't until October of 2012 when I actually commissioned as a second lieutenant to the United States Army Reserves. So I'm not a math person, but that was almost a year. It took a long time. I had to fill out paperwork, uh, and then I waited, and then I got shuffled off to a new recruiter because that recruiter PCS'd or he moved, and I had to literally start over with a new recruiter. And then, lo and behold, the Army changed the process or the, the, uh, the recruiting packet. They were transitioning. So I filled out a third recruiting packet. And so it was almost as if the Lord was saying, do you really want to do this? And, and I told the recruiter, I'm like, I think God really wants me to do this because otherwise I would have just quit this process by now. But then I had to wait. I had to go to MEPS, which is the medical place where you have all the tests done. And then I had to get a waiver because I had had a joint broken in high school and a surgery on an elbow. So I had to get a waiver. I had to go to a surgeon and, and get approval. And, and that finally went through. Then I had to wait and then have my packet go before a selection board. And so the recruiter had to get it ready. And he missed the April board. He missed the May board because he didn't have it submitted in time. And I was just questioning now the competence of the Army folks. <laughs> like, maybe, maybe I should have held off for the Air Force. I don't know. Um, and then there wasn't going to be a June one or a July one. And then it's like, but finally, I remember getting the phone call in September. We were at teachers' convention in Schaumburg, Illinois. And I got the phone call. I knew when the board was convening. I was waiting. I finally got the call. And then it was time for me to finally put my uniform on and go down after all that to go in October, the end of October, to my first drill in, in the reserve unit. So this was going to be uh, almost seven months before I would go to chaplain basic school. So I remember, though, after all of that, finally getting in the relief of becoming a, a chaplain or a chaplain candidate, and I, I remember driving the 30 minutes down to my reserve center, having the insecurity, the questions, the fear. Am I really doing the right thing? Have I made a mistake? Because now I've got to go like, be with all these other Army people, and I've never been in the Army before. I remember praying and reminding myself, this is what God has called me to do. And I had to give myself pep talks over and over again for 30 minutes. And then I got to the parking lot and I'm sitting in my car watching people go in and I have to like get out of the car now. And I'm dreading it. Am I gonna salute right? Am I gonna say sir to the right people or ma'am to the right people? Am I gonna do something I'm supposed to do or not do something that I'm not supposed to do? In many ways, I felt like Gideon. By the way, I could have used, we didn't read it yet, but I could have used Judges 6.23 at that moment. You say, what's Judges 6.23? Then the Lord said to Gideon, peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to try to cover Judges chapter 6. We've got lots of time. It's 4.17. So... We can be here a long time. I have until 7 o'clock, so that's two hours and some change. Gideon's story, I think, can be broken up into three segments. Okay, in your Bible, he goes from Genesis 6, it's Genesis, excuse me, Judges 6 to Judges, uh, the end of Judges chapter 8. Uh, I think you can break it up, though, not necessarily by chapter. Judges 6, though, gets what I call his calling. Uh, Judges 7 through chapter 8, verses 21. 
uh, gets what I call his commanding. And that's the story that you're familiar with, with Gideon and his men and, and trumpets and, 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 and pots and, and all that stuff, candles. We'll get to that later. But then it also gets then finally the last part of his life is what I call his conclusion. And so we'll get to those things over the next three weeks, although we do take a break for uh, the uh, 24th. We won't have an evening service that night. So his calling, his commanding, and his conclusion. And so tonight we're going to try to get through his calling. Okay, and we do this with the following. Number one, the problem described. The problem described, and we'll go through this rather quickly because some of this is going to parallel what we've already talked about for other periods or generations in the, in the time of Judges. Okay, the problem is described. In verse 1 it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Right, again, a familiar phrase to us. Okay, and, and I simply wrote this in my notes. The what, the how, the who they worshipped were not told. We could go back to chapter 2, verse 11, and where it describes that the people often fa fell into that Baal worship or the Ashtoreth worship. We could go into that. We could f go ahead in the story where he, he's told to tear down an idol to Baal into an Ashtoreth, and we can kind of surmise, but there could have been other things involved as well. We don't know what exactly the evil was. God leaves it pretty generic at this point. Could have been a lot of things. The point is, uh, they had failed to faithfully follow God. And so they have the sin problem, so then God brings them the second problem, which is the Midianite problem. And so God describes that then in verses 2 and following, where the hand of Midian had come against them. And even we read about the Amalekites, and there's also this people from the east that are not described. The Amalekites is this old foe that they had faced, even with Moses leading them up. Um, you know, hundreds of years before. And so these individuals bring oppression to them, and God has allowed this. I can't remember if this is in your notes or not, but this was a promised condition of covenant breakers, by the way. Back in Deuteronomy 28, 29, we have this phrase, this promise made that God had given to them that's, that certainly is fulfilled in Gideon's time. Deuteronomy 28, 29 says, And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. Listen, you shall not prosper in your ways. You shall only be oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you for at least for a seven-year period. Right? You have these, uh, the Israelites are in hideouts. Right? Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. You know, he's in this vat. He's kind of hiding out because... If he's seen, they're going to come down and take the food that he's, that he's even threshing, right? He's, he's eking out an eager, uh, meager, rather, existence. And so these people descend upon them, right? They can't harvest the land for themselves. The enemies come in and take, take, take. And it's all because of the sin of the land, of the sin of the people. And so there's sin there, which again is not unfamiliar to, to the people at this time. Okay, now remember, they don't have the book of Judges. Uh, there's no journal of the Judges. Okay, now maybe there was some oral tradition uh, that they could go back to, that they could hear from their generation of what the generations before had experienced, how there had been sin, oppression, crying out, God sends a judge, and there had been deliverance. Okay, but they can't turn their Bibles to Judges chapter 5 and look at how God had previously delivered. They can't do that. Okay, all they know is what they're experiencing. And so they're living in that reality. And so notice then, number two, we have the prophets reply. The prophets reply in verses 7 through 10. It came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Right, this is the... This is the response that God wants from his people, from his children, right? Pressure on them. He wants them to respond to them, to respond to him, rather. They cry out because of the Midianites. Verse 8, that the Lord sent a prophet. You say, who's the prophet? I don't know. He's not named. 
But he sends a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from the Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Now don't fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But notice this, this really this statement of condemnation then. But you have not obeyed my voice. So what did Israel expect from God? Well, again, if they knew anything of, of past history, they expected a judge to deliver them, right? If they knew anything even of the Exodus, when they had been mistreated by Pharaoh for generations, when they cried out to God, who did God send them? Moses. So they cry out to God, what do they expect? Instead of Moses, the deliverer, he sends a prophet to them, though. And what did they get from God? They got a messenger and they got a message. By the way, this would be the equivalent of you driving home from church or you out in the country or you out on the highway and your car breaks down and you call the tow service. And instead of sending the tow truck or someone to fix your tire, uh, they send a counselor to you to sit on the side of the road and talk to you about your, the situation you're in. What good does that do you? Probably not really good in that situation. But in their situation, at least for the Israelites, it was necessary for them to see that God had sent them into the hand of Midian. Why? Because they had not listened to his voice. They had not obeyed God. They were covenant breakers. Remember, none of this was God playing gotcha. None of this was a secret. God had told them. He had given them the law. He had prepared them in this and for this. If you keep my commands, I will bless you. I will keep you in the land. That's what God had prepared them their parents, their parents' parents, right? The generations before. That was what Moses' leadership was all about prior to coming into the land. Lest we wag our, or shake our heads too much at them, though, we sometimes pray to be delivered from circumstances, sometimes of our own doing. And instead of the answer we want, we're reminded from the word or from the Lord that what we need is to stop and to be still and to listen to the voice of the Lord as recorded in the pages of the Bible. And it may be hard for us to stop and to look at that, but we need that. Right? In the midst of difficulty, we need to stop and remind ourselves that maybe we're in the trouble we're in because we haven't been listening to God's word. In the midst of difficulty, notice, though, how God continues to respond to them. He sends them his word through his messenger. But notice number three, God's grace is reassured. God's grace is reassured. Okay, we read the passage already. But read it from the perspective or listen from the perspective of God's grace. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of those who oppressed you, drove them out and gave you their land. I am the Lord your God. Do not fear them. Rather than continue a pronouncement of judgment for not obeying God's voice, the message really abruptly stops. Even though he says, you've not obeyed my voice, he doesn't continue on. He stops right there. So we listen to what he says and even what he doesn't say. We might expect that God continues on with consequences for not obeying him. But not so here. The Bible provides a reminder of God's grace even towards sinning people. We have wonderful scriptures that remind us of how gracious God is even towards sinning people. Scriptures like Psalm 103, verse 11. 
For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. By the way, the grace that Israel is about to experience from a loving God certainly parallels the grace that the New Testament believer experiences in Christ. I love Ephesians chapter 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all conducted ourselves. Once we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We did evil in the sight of the Lord, Ephesians 2, 4, but God. What a great promise and proclamation of God's grace. God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, what did he do? He sent his son. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, this is grace. Grace, God's grace. Grace defined as unmerited favor, a gift from God that I don't deserve. And so God demonstrates his grace toward the people of Israel. And he's about to show his grace to Gideon. He's about to show his grace and he's going to provide his grace to Gideon in his promise of equipping. And that's number four. He promises to equip Gideon to be the leader that Israel needs. The Israel that they need, excuse me, the leader that they need. So number four, we have God's promise of equipping. And and really, we have these two long sections of the passage here, of the chapter. We begin with Judges chapter 6, verse 12. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and makes this statement. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. What an interesting statement. How coincidental, by the way, that we have this statement made on this day because this phrase, mighty man of valor, is the same phrase we looked at this morning. It's the exact same word in Hebrew from which we get the phrase, the mighty men of David from 2 Samuel 23. It's the exact same phrase that we have in reference to a guy named Boaz in Ruth chapter 2, and it's the exact same word we find in reference to Ruth, and it's the exact same word we find in reference to the Proverbs 20, or 31, virtuous woman. Again and again, we find the emphasis on the virtuous person, and that's who Gideon's called here. Okay, He's not necessarily this mighty warrior on his own, but he's the individual who God calls, who God will equip For the work to which God has for him. So again, this phrase, the mighty man of valor, we could interpret as the mighty man of valor or the man of valor that God will make mighty. What a blessing that God will take this man and make a mighty one out of him. Did Gideon see himself as this mighty man, by the way? I don't think so, because we have the questions that Gideon ra- that, that this phrase raises from Gideon, right? Look in your notes or in your Bibles. Judges chapter 6, verse 13, right? It's almost as if as soon as this phrase leaves the lips of the angel, by the way, the angel of the Lord is a reference to, this is a, I believe, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Okay, it's called a Christophany. Uh, without going through and kind of building a whole case for this, uh, the angel is going to accept worship in form of a sacrifice. God alone accepts sacrifice and worship in the scriptures. If this had been an angel as in like a cherub or a seraph, that's the singular form of cherubim or seraphim, if this had been one of those type angels, they always refuse worship. Okay, They always declare themselves to be servants just like the human servants of the Most High. 
Okay, you can do those studies on your own. Uh, this angel of the Lord accepts the sacrifice and, decla- and shows a mighty work uh, in the passage. Okay, so anyway, but when you have the pronouncement um, from the Lord, right, this angel of the Lord, the pronouncement in verse 12, immediately these questions rise. Look at verse 13. Gideon says to him, Oh my Lord, uh, if the Lord is with us, okay, because the sacrifice is yet to happen. So Gideon's not quite sure yet, but he will be. He says, if the Lord is with us, oh, why then has all this happened to us? And why are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then even in verse 15, so he said unto him, this is Gideon speaking to the Lord, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Okay, who's Manasseh or what was Manasseh? Well, it's, it's not even a, a full tribe as we think of it. Uh, Manasseh was not one of the regular sons of Jacob. It was a half tribe as we call it. it. Manasseh was one of the sons of Joseph. So it was one of the smaller tribes even. But notice he even makes this statement, and I don't know that he's even being falsely humble. He says, I am the least in my father's house. But yet the angel proclaimed of him, you are this mighty man of valor, or this virtuous man that God will make mighty. But Gideon raises these questions. Okay, now, if you think about the questions in verse 13, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? That's a hard question. Now, again, if Gideon had had Judges 6, he could go back and look at Judges 6.1. Okay, now, again, I don't know if Gideon is aware of the national sins of Israel at this point. I don't know. But we do see somebody here struggling with what's going on. He's wrestling with the issues at hand. And I think this just demonstrates that, at least for him, he's struggling with this. And he's, and he's openly questioning or asking this question of God. So I ask, I ask the question in my notes, is it okay to question God? I think it all depends on the attitude. I don't think Gideon is pounding his fist on the table. I don't think he's demanding these things irreverently of God. I think he's really just wrestling with these things. I think he's struggling with these things, especially in light of the pronouncement that he is some way tied to the deliverance of God's people. Seeing himself as this small individual. And remember, we're before God is going to use a little shepherd boy to defeat a giant. That hasn't happened yet. That's, that's like years away. So Gideon has these questions. And sometimes, by the way, questions of, that we have are not directly answered. Now, I think it's interesting... I think it's important to note Gideon is not chided for his questions. However, and maybe this is not helpful to you, God does not answer his questions directly. So if you're out there tonight with questions about why you've had to, to go through certain things, or maybe why you are going through certain things right now, and you have these open, honest questions for God as to why you are facing certain things, why you are going through certain difficulties. You can bring them in a humble attitude before God. Right? God says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask ask of God. Right? You can bring your, cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. But notice how Gideon is answered. Verse 14. The first answer looks like this. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go 
in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? Okay, this answer is an answer that says, look to me. Put your dependence on me. My strength is sufficient for you. Okay, this kind of harkens back to when Moses tries to make excuses. God says, don't I, don't I know who's made your mouth? Who makes you different from another? I have. I know you. Go do what I told you to do. God, do, God knows. God says, have I not sent you? Go do it. Then verse 16, the second answer. The Lord says to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. God promises him a strength. You're going to defeat them as one man. What great assurance he provides him. Sometimes we have to remember God's promises in the midst of those difficulties. We may not have answers that we want, but we always have God's promises of his presence, God's promises of his provision, God's promises that he will be with us and he will never leave us. Can I give you some verses tonight that should be an encouragement to you? I love these verses, by the way. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. There's obviously biblical allusions even within that passage of individuals who pass through the water unharmed. Moses leading the Israelites through the Red Sea. Joshua leading the children of Israel across the Jordan River. You think about the men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or Hananiah, Ezra, Mishael, those three, being in the fiery furnace, coming out not even smelling like fire because God had so completely delivered them despite Nebuchadnezzar saying, you know, make it seven times hotter. I picture the little temperature needle going and then like go, you know, breaking off. But God delivered them. Isaiah 43, 2 was that reference. How about Isaiah 59, 1 and 2? Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Right? It's never God that moves from us, it's us that moves from him. That's why James promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Take that step towards him. Humble yourself, and he will draw near. Take those steps back to God. God will be there. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, a verse that Gideon could have known. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Gideon hears God's promises, but by the way, still seeks a sign. So here we come to Judges chapter 6, verse 17. Then Gideon says to the angel of the Lord, If now I have found favor in your sight, okay, you know, he's had his questions not answered or answered kind of, these promises have been made, but then he says, If I found favor in your sight, show me a sign that it is you who walk or talk with me. How does God respond? More grace. Okay, God could have hit him upside with the holy hand of, you know, <laughs> wake him up. But look at verse 18. I love this. You can see Gideon starting to... The wheels are turning. He's coming up with this test, the sign he's asked for. Gideon's like, don't depart from here, I pray, until I come back to you with an offering and set it before you. So can you just wait here for a minute? 
And here's what God says. I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat. He's scrambling away, right? He finds a goat and he's cleaning it. Uh, unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. He's baking this bread, right? The meat he puts in a basket and then he uh, puts the broth in a pot. He comes back and he finds the angel under the terebinth tree, presents it to them. The angel of God says to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. He did so. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord put out the end of a staff that was in his hand. He touches the meat, touches the, meat the unleavened bread. Fire arose out of the rock, <sighs> consumes the meat. And the unleavened bread, the angel of the Lord departed from his sight. Poof, gone. Now you know. It's God. It's God. God does as Gideon asks. Again, God's grace. What's Gideon's response? Look at verse 22. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, alas, O Lord God. Right? This is Gideon's light bulb. Ding! Goes off. O oh Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then Gideon's response then is, I mean, I think this is what we call the awesomeness of God, right? A holy fear, a reverent fear. As he's confronted with the awesomeness of God. So then once again, God provides reassurance to his servant. Judges 26, 23, and 24. Then the Lord says to him, Peace be with you. Here's the verse that I needed. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Literally, Yahweh Shalom. And then the author of, of Judges makes the statement to this day, as in the, when the day that he wrote the book of Judges, to this day, uh, this altar is still there. In Ophrah of the, this place. So you have Gideon's response of, to God is, is the only thing I can think right, or the New Testament parallel is think Thomas when he sees Jesus, the resurrected Christ, and Jesus says, Thomas, put your hand right here. Thomas, put your hand right here. And what's Thomas's proclamation? Yeah, my Lord, my God, right? The light bulb clicks. It's you. It is you. You are you. This is Gideon saying, this is God. Yes, yes. I finally get it. Okay, okay. And, and, and his response now is, I've seen God. I'm probably going to die. And so then God's reassurance, God's grace is, you're not going to die. It's okay. But, number five, I am going to require something of you. So we see God's requirement of commitment. God's requirement of commitment. Verse 25 says, It came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that's beside it. Verse 27, so Gideon took, took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. You can underline that. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So God had answered Gideon's request. Now God makes a request of Gideon, tear down that idol. So we have in these two verses what I call ask and answered. Commanded, obeyed. Now, some people make a big deal about Gideon doing this at night because he feared the men of the city. I don't know that that's a big deal. I might have done the same thing. Night operate. I was talking to somebody about night vision. You know, that was a big thing. I mean, in, in global war on terror, whether it was Iraq or especially in Afghanistan, but uh, we ran night operations. Why? Because it was safer to do it at night. And, and the phrase that the American military adopted was this, we owned the night. 
Not that we didn't suffer casualties or have people die, we did, but we were much, much safer at night, so we did operations at night. Gideon did his operations at night. You make of it what you will. But here's what I see. He obeyed God. God told him to do it. He did it. Now, why did God make this request? Well, this obviously would have been something near and dear to Gideon in the sense that, I'm not saying Gideon had worshipped there, but this was at his father's house. And I think that because of the proximity to where Gideon had set up this altar to God, God is a jealous God and he's not willing to share his space with anyone. So Gideon had made an altar to God and offered worship, and God would not share his glory with anyone, so he would not allow another altar to be in his presence. Okay, there were probably at this time hundreds or maybe thousands of, of Baal worshiping places, spaces, idols in the land. Why this one? Maybe because of that. But I think as God was preparing to deliver Israel, he wanted to make sure Israel was committed to obedience. And it began with Gideon, who was this man of valor that God would make mighty, make mighty in Israel's sight, and make mighty to deliver. And can I just say, we are not called to tear down those kind of idols, but God requires the same level of commitment from us too. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. And so do you know that that means every time you open the Bible to read for devotions and you see a requirement that God places upon the believer, he expects us to work to do that. Do you know that every time you come and sit in church and hear the word of God taught, he expects you to do what the word of God says you're supposed to do. You're supposed to work at that. Now, will you perfectly do what the Bible says? Of course not. But that is to be what you are to aim at, right? You are to make that your daily aim to keep the word of God, just as I am. Because Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Jesus says we demonstrate our love for him by striving to do what he says. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, we have the great picture of obedience. Philippians 2, 8 says, In being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see, God expects commitment from his followers. Whether it's tearing down a literal idol or whether God says, Take the idols out of your heart that are preventing you from following me. I was talking to somebody, I don't remember, Dave maybe, we were talking about the idols that Americans, we've become very sophisticated at making idols. We can make an idol out of any good thing today, by the way, folks. We need to check ourselves and check our hearts. And by the way, my idols may not be your idols. And we need to do a, a hard look at ourselves, each of us. Have that commitment to obey God. Number six, we find finally here God's assurance to settle him. God's assurance to settle him. Verse 36 says this, So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, Look, <laughs> I shall put a, fle a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it's dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece. You say, what, do you, what does that mean? What kind of dew? Mountain dew, of course. <laughs> a bowl full, oh wait, I'm sorry, a bowl full of water, I'm sorry. Verse 39, then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me, but uh, can I speak just once more? Can, uh, can, can we do this once again? But this time, can the ground be dry? Or excuse me, can the fleece be dry, but the ground be wet with dew? And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but 
the dew was on all the ground. This is the passage that gives us the famous term, the fleece test. You say, what do we know about this? Well, a couple ideas as we're finishing up. God graciously goes along with Gideon to settle him and put him at ease. You say the fleece test. How dumb does he have to be? It really doesn't matter, but for whatever reason, Gideon needed this. Gideon needed this, right? He still didn't believe God's word of Genesis. I keep saying Genesis. Judges 6.23. You shall not die. Gideon still thought he was going to die. Okay? Gideon still thought it. By the way, if you look at uh, Joshua chapter 1, more than once, God had to tell Joshua, don't be afraid. Be strong and of good courage. And by the way, when Joshua goes and tells the people what to do, what do the people tell Joshua? Only be strong and of good courage. Like, don't be afraid. So again and again, Joshua was still afraid. And so he had to have reassurance again and again and again. Gideon needed the same reassurance. God is gracious and kind and very patient with him. Uh, way more patient than I would have ever been. Um, yet another reason why it's good that Rick Melvin is not God. God is patient with his people. I can't help but think about the patience, by the way, of the Lord Jesus with his disciples. Uh, God shows us great patience with Gideon here. How many times would Jesus have probably done the face palm with the disciples? Probably more than we can count. How many times did Jesus sigh with the disciples? Probably more than we could count. Okay, but yet Jesus loved them to the end. He loved them. By the way, on the night he was to be betrayed, he was the one comforting them and telling them to be at peace. He was the one serving them, washing their feet. He was the one feeding them at the Lord's Supper. What a great picture. What a great picture. Jesus comforted them in his nearest moment of agony. As we think about Gideon, he certainly is, a, we, see, we find a transformation from fear to faith. In the passage here, we see God ever faithful. Certainly with God, we find him granting opportunities for him to proclaim this mighty man of valor, to live up to that name through God's empowering spirit. And though it's different, certainly God offers the same to us today. Though in different ways, God wants us to be settled in faith and equipped for his service as he's called us to. But folks, can I say God requires the same level of commitment and obedience from us today. God stands ready to pour his grace on us, his amazing grace at salvation and certainly every day in the Christian life. Let us move daily from fear to faith, from fear to faith and ever be like our faithful God. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for how you've blessed, and what a great story of, of Gideon. And Lord, the longer I live, the more I find myself in stories of the Bible like Gideon, testing you, uh, requiring your patience, leaning on your grace and your mercy. And so, Father, I do thank you for uh, this great example. And look forward to seeing how you will use him in still an unexpected way. And Father, I do thank you for the testimony of your word and the example set before us. And so, Father, we do just pray that you will continue to be with us, uh, continue to use your word. As you promise, it never returns void, but always accomplishes your purpose. And so I pray that your spirit will continue to use your word in our lives, apply it to us, so that we may be the people for your honor and glory. Use us this week, Father, to be light, to be salt. May people see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. I pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Lord bless you as you go. Thank you.